I am the president of the Brandywine Naaman's Rotary Club, and I invited Lisa Thomas Lord to come and speak with her, speak with us about her book and her struggle with an, um, an illness that she had, that she overcame. So we have speakers often here, and I thought she would be really, really good for us to talk to, to talk to us about her issues. And um, she's been legendary in the Delaware Valley. Um, she's a legend journalist with 6ABC, so we're really privileged to have her here. Rotarians feed millions, uh, immunize millions of children each year. Beside polio, there are many unbelievably terrific End Hunger Now programs that Rotarians champion. Um, but they have the uh, Million Meal Challenge coming up. Uh, Rot Rotarians raise funds, purchase food items, <clears throat> and package that food that provides food for hundreds of thousands of people each and every year. Some of the things I learned at Rotary, I, I, I would hear these terms but never really quite understand exactly what they meant. I, I, I know the term interact because our club actually hosts an interact program. Darla has gotten us involved with a high school and we create um, a Rotary uh, club amongst high school students and, um, and, the and the middle school as well. Right. Okay. So I know what that is. I wasn't very sure about Rotaract, but Rotaract is like a community based Rotary program. We have, there's a youth exchange program that Rotary champions, and RILA is our Rotary Youth Leadership Awards that I learned a little bit more about. So Rotary is an international service organization that with, this is an interesting thing, I did not know this before I went to the pets. At the United Nations, okay, every country is represented for the most part at the United Nations. There's only two seats at the United Nations that are represented by nine countries one is the Red Cross, and the other one is Rotary. Rotary is represented at the United Nations with the Red Cross. Really fantastic. Shows you what a, a terrific organization Rotary is to have earned that honor. <clears throat> Some of the things that this particular club has done. So th this is my last pitch. If anybody's interested in, in, in helping uh, your, your community both locally or you want to get involved in an international program, Rotary is a terrific vehicle for you to get involved with. This particular club can boast spearheading the development of a can-do playground, which is a playground designed for children of all abilities, whether they be challenged in some capacity or non-challenged. Uh, all, all children can play at this playground and enjoy a safe, fun environment and in our Rotary Club, along with other clubs, we pulled together our resources, but the cl this club took the lead and developed that program within our community. An international program that we've, been, we've accomplished and we're very proud of, <clears throat> this particular club spearheaded um, an initiative where we uh, garnered the support of both local and national Rotary Clubs, as well as clubs as far away as Australia international clubs and we actually put together and completed a program that was a water and sanitation program designed to install 150 micro flush toilets that use one cup of water per flush so it's very water efficient and we dug two borehead wells in the city of Nelerigo, uh, Africa which is on the west coast and this club can can take pride in in that there's a big plaque where we dug these wells that have the name of our club, the name of the sister clubs that helped us, and the other clubs throughout the world that helped us, as well as a couple of the businesses that donated. So Rotary is making an impact both locally and globally. If you want to get involved with your community, you want to have a fun time with others that are like-minded, who are interested in providing service to others, Rotary is your, your uh, one stop. And I would uh, ask if anybody's interested in considering being a member or joining, come see me after the meeting. Thank you. All right, without further ado, I would like to bring up our guest, and she is Lisa Thomas Laurie. She is a veteran, legendary journalist with 6ABC. But in, in cahoots with, or in conjunction with, 
Lisa. I have a surprise for us. I'm going to bring up my friend, Lauren Wilson, who is also a veteran 6ABC journalist. So we have two for one. Doesn't get much better than that. So Lisa, if you don't mind, you'd come up and present to our club. We are so, so grateful that you chose us and you said, you said yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very You're welcome. welcome. I cannot say no to my soar wars. <laughs> Ski wee. Ski -wee. <laughs> but, um, the soar wars, please stand because they were so gracious to me. <laughs> You'll excuse the, the tail end of my cough drop. Um, I swear, this has been a rough winter, hasn't it? I feel like I've had some kind of little bug all winter. But then I'm reminded I have a wonderful new grandson who's in daycare and he brings home everything. <laughs> So they, I'm told that next year we'll be um, immune to everything. So I hope that part of it pans out. Oh boy, I think about my journey sometimes. And we all have our journeys if we really sit down and think about each of us. If we think about what we've been through and what we've learned, we want to share it. You know, I've been out on this book tour and I have to tell you, I never intended to write a book. I retired from Channel 6 in 2016 after um, it became evident, is this on? Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. After it became evident that I was going to need a second bone marrow transplant. I have a, a strange illness and I'll get to that a little bit later, but I've been so fortunate. You know, I used to hear people who had cancer talk about cancer being my friend and how much stronger I got, how much I learned what a better person I am when, when, when I went through cancer. And I never understood that until I got this precancerous baffling condition. And it does make you slow down, especially if you have a busy life like I did. And it does make you think and it makes you feel gratitude. And that's what I've come to really appreciate in my life. Gratitude for all those people and all those things that really mattered in my life. My story starts in a little town in Institute, West Virginia. Unincorporated, 2,700 people, also known as Chemical Valley. Um, on one side of my house, within a mile radius, was carbide, chemical plant. On the other side was DuPont. And it became very common for me and my extended family and my friends to expect monthly small explosions at one or many of those plants, or several, I should say. Our water would be brown. It would rust out the, the chrome in the bathtub. Sometimes my three brothers and I would head to the school bus in the morning and there would be a yellow powdery substance on the lawns. And we knew it wasn't pollen because it was winter or it might be summer. And that became a, a, a regular happenstance for us. Little did I know that <clears throat> some of the things that were happening at those chemical plants might play a role in my illness some 35 years later. I would certainly explore that. But I like to think also of, of the wonderful times, the good times. Institute West Virginia was a great place to grow up. Everybody looked after everybody else. Everybody's kid was, was subject to the discipline of Mrs. Brown down the street, uh, Mrs. Dunbar across the, the valley, and we had the, that's where my passion 
for literature, for reading, for writing. I used to write plays in third grade. And um, I would star my, I would cast myself in the leading role <laughs> and cast my friends as supporting actors. And one time I wrote a play and our teacher, Mrs. Louise Thompson, she was also principal of Institute West Virginia, liked it so much that she let me present it to the third and fourth grade class and their parents one evening. And I remember the feeling I got when we finished that play and there was thunderous applause and everyone stood up and um, the praise that I enjoyed the most though was that of my father. I was the only girl, the oldest, and adored my dad. And I remember him, he would tease, a big tease, and he, he would bend down and say to me, not bad for a little yellow colored girl from Institute West Virginia. <laughs> We'd laugh about that for years and years and years because it wasn't the first time he would say it. The love and passion for writing and um, literature went with me when I went to Dunbar. Um, we were the Bulldogs and I was editor of the Kennel and fashion editor and enjoyed it very much. When it was time to go to college, most of my friends were going to Institute's West Virginia State College. It is now West Virginia State University. And it was an all black school. Leon Sullivan went there. Um, there's a city councilwoman, and her name escapes me at the time. If you know, please remind me. But there's a city council, Augusta Clark went there. Um, and I didn't want to go right across the street to college. I, mean, I wanted that college experience. I wanted to live in the dorm. And so there was, um, but I knew we couldn't afford for me to go too much farther than <laughs> Institute uh, or West Virginia State College. So I remember my aunt told me that there was um, a scholarship, a state scholarship. She had been in education throughout her days in um, Charleston. And she suggested that I apply. So I applied for the state scholarship and lo and behold, got it and it paid one year's tuition to either West Virginia University or Marshall in Huntington, West Virginia. And I chose Marshall because they had a pretty good journalism department. So I headed off to Marshall University, and mind you, it was the year after the terrible plane crash. Marshall experienced probably the worst sports tragedy um, in, in college sports history. The students there had lost their entire football team in a plane crash, and many dignitaries in the city, and relatives of the mayor, and coaches and such on campus. So there was um, a pall, um, there was a very solemn mood that lay over the university, but it also united the students, black and white. And it's, um, I look back and ironically, we were on the verge of having some uprisings. There was some racial, tension between white and black students. Of the 10,000 students, only 500 were black. But that all dissipated when that plane crash happened. And it united us and brought us together. And um, it was quite a learning experience for everyone. But they were very productive years. I ran out, that scholarship for me ran out. Um, actually before the end of my second semester. And a good friend of mine, an upperclassman, knew of a weather position, a weather job at the local NBC station, WSAZ TV, and suggested that I'd be a good fit. So I went down and auditioned for it and I landed this weather job. And remember, we didn't have meteorologists then. We were weather girls. <laughs> and all we really had to know, no, was the 50 states, and we had to know how to look nice when we pointed to the low pressure and the high pressure and the 
what state where one was happening. We didn't have five or seven day forecasts, we had two day forecasts. <laughs> so I was the weekend weather girl for throughout my college days on the weekend. And um, I can remember wanting to do a good job, but not quite taking it as seriously as I should. I was pledging Alpha Kappa Alpha, and that job sometimes got in the way of things that I wanted to do uh, leisure for in my leisure life and in, in, in my sorority life. So it wasn't um, uncommon for me to appear on the news with something like this, like a turban wrapped around my head, and I wore a halter top once, and I was rushing in from the, from the pool from a big event the AKAs were having. And it got to the point where my mother didn't want to watch anymore. She was, <laughs> she was afraid. She was quite fearful of what I'd show up in. The sports director, Tom Jacobs, approached me one day, and he said, you know, I think Boz, our Boz Johnson, was very well known and highly respected in the industry. And he said, I think a boss might want to see you uh, one day this week. And he's going to talk to you about your clothes. And one week passed, and two weeks passed. And I said, Tom, he hasn't called me in yet. He said, I know. And I was about to get a really good lesson in ratings, especially overnight ratings. He said, did you see the overnight ratings, and have you looked at the monthly ratings? And I said, no. Well, it seems that on several dates when Boz was going to call me in to talk about those turbans and those halter tops and the big clunky AKA jewelry that I wore, <laughs> the, my viewership spiked. <laughs> and they knew that people were tuning in just to see what crazy outfit I'd wear. <laughs> but... Um, we never had that talk, and I toned it down. I think I started to mature a little, and I toned it down a little bit. But those were great days, and um, when I got out of college uh, in 1975, um, I had quite a little bit of experience. Now, I'll backtrack just a bit because that, that last semester at college, I did ask to do some reports. I said, I'd love to do some reporting. I didn't think that I wanted to do the weather all my, all my life. I didn't think I wanted to make it a career at the time, and I wanted to try my hand at reporting. And they gave me a 36-millimeter camera and the keys to the news van, and they said, okay, go report. And I actually would have to come up with my stories. I'd have to shoot my stories, come back to the station, and edit my stories. So it was great learning ground. And uh, I loved it. I really loved it. When I graduated, I had eight offers. It came at a time when the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, was cracking down on stations to hire women and to hire minorities. And I was in the right place at the right time. And I had to choose between Kentucky, um, gosh, Pensacola, Florida, a lot of little places. Oklahoma is the place I chose. And I chose to go to Oklahoma because it had a good news department and it paid the most. My first job, $14,000 a year. I was smoking. I was so, <laughs> I was so happy. And it was, quite a, it was quite a distance, but my mother had a cousin who lived in nearby Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, I, w I went to OKC, and um, it didn't take long for me to realize I really did not like Oklahoma. <laughs> it was flat, there were no mountains, there was nothing green, but I did like the work. So I threw myself into the work, and uh, back in those days, we went, we went out to cover the news in pairs. And I was paired with a tall, blonde gentleman named Dave Smith, who I still keep in touch with today. And we had advanced from those 36 millimeter cameras to CP16s. They're about nine pounds, big. Put them on your shoulder. I'd shoot his story and he would shoot mine. Then we would go back to the station. 
we'd retreat into this little room, a little closet-like room, and literally splice and glue our film. It was film then. We'd do our own audio, and I really learned the nuts and bolts of, of news gathering. But I was told by Boz back in West Virginia that I really should stick it out a year. And it was, it was tough. On the weekends, I'd go down to Dallas because my brothers lived there. Two of my brothers lived there. It, um, <clears throat> it was a pretty tough environment to get adjusted to. Eight months in, um, a station in Nashville, Tennessee called. And I was so excited. It was a few, it was a little step up, I think, uh, at that time, as far as the size of the station and the market. I think at that time, Oklahoma was 37, Nashville was 33, and I really wanted to go. And Boz said, if you get the offer, then you should probably take it. So I go down for the interview, and I remember like it was yesterday, I'm sitting on the edge of my bed in the hotel room, Sunday night, going to have an interview with Chris Clark, the news director, Monday morning. So I immediately turn on the TV set to see what, what this station is all about, what it's like. And there's a black woman anchoring the news, solo. I was mesmerized. My jaw dropped. I had never seen that. Most people had never seen that. And what struck me was she was young. She looked to be about my age. I couldn't be sure. But she was so confident and so poised. And I said, boy, I hope I meet her tomorrow. So I go in the next day for my interview, and the secretary sits me outside the news director, Chris Clark's office, and I see this young woman over on the other side of the newsroom. So I mosey over there and introduce myself, and I, I said, hi, I, my name's Lisa Howard, and I saw you last night, and you were terrific. And she said, well, thanks for saying so. She says, you know, you're a tall drink of water, aren't you? <laughs> and we kidded around a little bit. And she said, I said, well, you didn't tell me your name. And she said, oh, my name's Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and I said, well, you are wonderful. She said, you know, I'm going to be taking you out. You're going to shadow me. And so I did. I shadowed her that day and went on her stories. And we hit it off and talked about everything. I learned that we were both 19 years old. Uh, both born in 1954, the year of Brown versus Board of Education. And we talked about what had happened in the industry and what had happened, what was happening in television. And she said to me at the end of the day, you know, you, um, when are you going back? Are you going back tonight? And I said, no, in the morning. And she says, well, don't stay in the hotel. Come stay at my apartment. We'll, we'll chat some more. So that night we talked about everything in the business. We talked about our boyfriends and I learned that Oprah was about to interview for a job in Baltimore as co-anchor uh, of a pri the primetime weekly newscast and she was both nervous and excited about it and um, she was, she, I, I, when I see her very rarely these days she always teased me, teases me about making my own clothes because <laughs> I used to make all of my clothes. And in fact, when I retired, she um, sent a video tribute and she talked about being a trailblazer and doing everything. And she says, and don't forget, I remember when you were making your own clothes with those Butterick patterns. <laughs> <laughs> but what we, what most people also did not know was that Oprah had interviewed for the same job in Philadelphia that I had landed and she was turned down for. That call came after I was in Nashville about two years. Loved Nashville. My mother had gone to Fisk. There was Meharry and Vanderbilt and the Grand Ole Opry, a lot of things to do. And anyway, the call came and I didn't know for several years that Oprah had gotten that call first. She wasn't liking Baltimore. Baltimore wasn't treating her as well as she'd like on the anchor desk. But anyway, um, we laughed about it afterwards because we both knew why 
she got that, she was rejected for that job and I got it. I didn't have the anchor experience. I didn't have any of that under my belt. It had to do with race relations in Philadelphia and the fact that many news managers and news directors, um, general managers, they were afraid of how the audience would accept a black person on the news. Here I come, little yellow Lisa Howard, and I'm light-skinned. They don't know, you know, if the audience will know that I'm black or Italian. And sure enough, that, that, that played exactly the way they thought it would. But Oprah and I would talk at night about that. And she did okay, by the way. <laughs> Not getting that job. <laughs> But we knew exactly what was going on, and um, we were able to, to move on and you know, accept that. Ironically, I had been turned down for a job in Washington, D.C., WJLA, for the opposite reason. There was not that same racism. The black community <clears throat> was more proactive. Uh, as one producer told me, if they're going to hire a black person, they want to be sure that the public knows they're black. There'd be too many questions with you. So I couldn't, for a while there, I thought I couldn't win. But I landed the job in Philadelphia. And the first thing that um, the talent scout, Joe Hunter, told me was, look, there is one condition. We have a Mark Howard here. And we don't want there to be confusion with Lisa Howard. So, would you mind changing your name? And I said, sure. So I, I took my mother's maiden name and I became Lisa Thomas. And um, I was there about six months and getting used to everything and was so, so thankful and fortunate to have as my co-anchor of the new news. Now, remind you, I had not anchored before. They hired me for an anchor position, turned down Oprah Winfrey, and I struggled a little bit those first three months, but I had Jim O'Brien by my side. And I know you all, most of you remember him. And he was quite a character, but something you may not know about Jim O'Brien was that he cared about that newsroom. He cared about our success more than anyone I knew there. And he told me one day in words only he could tell me, blank them. He says, I'm telling you, blank them. And they're, 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 they're messing with your mind. They're, they don't like your hair. They don't like your accent. You're a good news reader. Just blank them and focus on what you need to do. And sure enough, they had sent me to uh, Maurice Tannenbaum, a, a hairdresser across the street, because my hair was too big and thick and a little frizzy. And he thinned my hair and my hair wasn't right again for two years. But I had the traditional anchor bob <laughs> that everybody had. And they sent me to a, uh, they sent a voice coach to me. I still remember her name, uh, uh, Julia Wing from Temple University. And she came to teach me how to get rid of that Appalachian accent. And when she came in, I remember her saying, you know, they could, they could use me with a lot of other people here, but, but we'll work with you. And she really did. She taught me to breathe from my diaphragm. And she said, you want to speak universally. You know, you don't want people to be able to say, oh, I know where she's from, or I know where he's from. She was a godsend. She was really, really helpful. And, um, and Jim, I brought in names of, of boroughs and counties and districts and anything that I thought might trip me up. And he practiced with me. And we, we, we developed a bond that way, and I became very, very comfortable at the anchor desk. As soon as I did, Jim was up to his old tricks. He, he knew I was comfortable, so he, he used to like to play jokes. And one day, I, was going, I had a story in the teleprompter about the Schlitz Beer Brewery up in the Northeast. Remember when it was there? Well, Jim decided to change my copy. He changed Schlitz to 
to something else. And I said, the big story today is happening at the Schitt's Brewery in Northeast. <laughs> uh, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I know I turned about five shades of red, and I looked over, he was on the floor, <laughs> cracking up. And I had the nerve to, had the nerve to say to me in the commercial break, uh, break, he recovered well. Well, we heard it from our news director afterwards, but those were the types of little shenanigans behind the scenes, and I learned to give it right back to him. But um, um, six months in, um, they were looking for a morning talk show host, and they knew of uh, Dave Roberts up in Buffalo. That's where our general manager was from. And so they called Dave down and they said, Dave, we really want to hire you, and we got a problem. We, um, and I said that backwards, <laughs> they had a Dave Thomas up in Buffalo. And they said, we have a Lisa Thomas. And so we can't have a Dave Thomas and a Lisa Thomas. Would you pick, boy, I ruined that one, didn't I? <laughs> and would you pick another name? So Dave picked, for whatever reason, he picked Roberts. And we were all sitting around one day, and it reminded Jim, he used to call it the name game. He said, what is this with all of us changing our names? He said, I, I know that back in my day, and Jim's day, and even Jim Gardner's day, they didn't want ethnic names. So Jim Goldman was really, I mean, Jim Gardner was really Jim Goldman. And... Um, Jim O'Brien was Jim Oldman, and he said, but you two changed your name. And then he thought to who started that domino effect of name changes. He says, Mark, you started that. What's your real name? Mark would not have it. He did not want to tell anybody what his name was. So Jim goes upstairs and finds out in the business office, somehow gets the books, comes back down, and he said, did you know that Mark used to be Mark Mummerstein? <laughs> Apparently, Mark had changed his name legally years prior. But that was the type of bond and fun stuff we did. And then, of course, in 1983, we lost Jim in a terrible skydiving accident. And I didn't realize at that moment, it took me a while to realize that that would be a watershed moment for me because I assumed his duties at the anchor desk with Mark Howard, in the parades with Dave Roberts, and many, many other things. I don't my, you know, know if my career would have risen as fast because nobody was leaving Channel 6 unless there was a tragic, some sort of death. But um, on, that, on, on, on the date of his death, I remember every year what, um, what he meant to me and what he meant to our station. And for the next 20 years or so, my life was pretty idyllic. I, um, I was doing what I loved. I had a wonderful family by then. I married a local doctor and had two kids. I was at the height of my career. I was in the best of health. And I was working out with a trainer uh, three days a week after I take my kids to my boys to school. And then suddenly, without any warning, I started feeling these strange sensations in my feet, in my lower extremities, my legs. And I did what I guess every professional woman would, would do in the beginning. I, I sort of ignored it. I was too busy, you know. And then it got to the point where I was out on power walks with this young woman who was helping me. And um, my legs felt weaker. And then they started to get painful to the touch. So my husband, being a doctor, suggested I go to a neurologist, have an ENG, a nerve conduction study. I did just that and found out that, in fact, my ankles and the nerves in my feet all the way probably up to my kneecap were 30% weaker than they should be or had been. We didn't know why. So we continued the test. We continued for several weeks. And we went to um, a man who was a dear friend and a mentor of my husband's at Jefferson Medical College um, growing up. 
Edward, Edgar Kenton got it right, right in the beginning, about less than a month in. He did a day of testing and he said, you know, I think you have a very rare blood disease and I've only seen five cases in my career. He says, I'm getting ready to go to Atlanta. He was getting ready to leave Lankanau University, I mean, Lankanau Hospital. And um, he was going to do medical research down in Morehouse. And I'm going to have to refer you to another oncologist, hematologist here, and a neurologist at um, um, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. He said, that as a team, I think, and I'll, I'll be in touch. I think hopefully they'll get it right. Well, they kept his diagnosis for about two months, and then they dismissed it. They, for some reason, decided I did not have this rare disease called poems, by the way, that I had something else called CIDP. CIDP is an autoimmune disease. Poems is that blood disease. Our platelets in our blood should be between 250 and 400. Mine were off the chart. They were 1.4 million. CIDP is the autoimmune disease, chronic, inflammatory, demyelinating polyneuropathy. The only thing it had that I had was the polyneuropathy in the legs and feet. Why the doctors changed, we can, we can only guess. POEMS, also an acronym, polyneuropathy, organomegaly, which means your organs get larger, E for the endocrine system, out of whack, M for that blood element, monoclonal gammopathy, S for skin changes. I had three of the four. I had the blood issue with the platelets. I had the skin changes. My skin was starting to turn very bluish and grayish. Um, and the polyneuropathy and the, the weakness in the, the, the nerves of the legs, lower extremities. So with, with, without having Dr. Edgar Kenton right there, we unfortunately followed the advice of these two doctors, getting other people's advice along the way. They, they always agreed with the two doctors, our attending physicians, except for one lady was going back and forth to poems. It was mind-boggling, and you can imagine for my husband, a doctor, we, we thought we were asking all the right questions, and we thought we were asking enough questions. But we always thought about that poems in the, in the back of our minds. Um, for two and a half years, almost three years, we followed that wrong prognose, um, diagnosis. And I was uh, getting the wrong treatment. I was getting plasmapheresis, which is an exchange of your blood. I was getting steroids. And I was getting weaker and sicker. But the problem, if any of you have had steroids or have a loved one or know someone who's taken steroids, you know how they can mask your symptoms and they can make you feel like, oh yeah, you know, I'm stronger, I'm getting better. So it was a very, very confusing and frustrating time. And as it turned out, I had gone down to Florida for um, an unconventional treatment near Naples. Um, and got so sick that I had to be hospitalized there. And it was then that we decided that, that um, actually a gastroenterologist, friend of my husband's, got us at the Mayo Clinic. And he says, go there, get this last opinion, and see what they say, because um, it, it was really, really making me sick. I, I was in a wheelchair by that time. My vocal cord had been <clears throat> paralyzed, so I could no longer work. Couldn't project my voice. Fast forward to about a week, we were, I was strong enough to leave and go back home and arrange appointments. And about three weeks later, at the Mayo Clinic, there's this little doctor, well, an Italian woman named Dr. Dispensieri, Angela Dispensieri. And for one week, she had me undergo just about every test I had had, and then a couple of handfuls more of different testing. At the end, on a Friday, she calls me in and she says, you've got poems, you've had it all along. 
It's shutting you down. You need a bone marrow transplant, and I think you'll be almost 90% again. And she said, but, but you're too weak. You're too weak for a bone marrow transplant. So she sent me home to build up my pulmonary, my respiratory, mat, to get massive doses of chemo to wipe out those bad cells. Excuse me, I was, I was determined to, to get strong enough faster than she wanted. About a week before my 50th birthday, I came back, had the bone marrow transplant, and within five weeks started to feel all of those symptoms, or most of them, reverse. I was strong enough again. My, pul my, my vocal cord healed. Uh, my pulmonary was better. I could breathe. My voice came back. Uh, I still had the pain in my legs, and I still had some issues with the nerves in my legs because that's where it all started, and it took so long to get that definitive diagnosis. But I could live with that, and I was just so thankful. And I returned to work. Um, thankfully, Channel 6 left the door open, but the anchor desk I no longer had, and that was okay with me because... The one thing I liked most about my job was the reporting. I liked to be out there doing stories, being um, um, with, with our viewers, being among the people. And I remember one story that I wanted to do and didn't get the chance to um, before I decided to retire it had to do with the way I was received when I was out doing my stories. I would be in a neighborhood or I would be in a business and not one day went by where someone didn't say, I prayed for you. And I thought to myself, I was raised Catholic and along with my brothers, none of us continued to follow Catholicism. But my spirituality, my faith during all of this was strong and I knew it was because of that foundation that spiritual foundation that had been laid for me back when my mom was forcing me to go to catechism on Saturday and all the masses. So I, I remained strong. I never believed that, that my disease was going to get the best of me. I remember vividly, um, before I returned to Channel 6, one of the, our news director called and asked if I wanted to cover Oprah's 25th anniversary of her show and I had be I had become sort of the Oprah reporter because of our crossing paths in Nashville and, and being in touch and I said yes yeah I really do and she said you think you're strong enough you, you know and I, I absolutely do well I went up and I, I covered her and then she covered me she did a lengthy interview on, on my illness and what was happening and, of course, she asked that one question no one had asked me in, in a way that only Oprah could. And she said, I just can't believe that you had a bone marrow transplant. And I said, yes, and got into the disease and what it was about. And she said, did you think you were going to die? And immediately I said, no, never. And I said it so instantaneously that I had to think about it later. And I asked myself, why was I so sure? And it was because of that, that strong faith that my mom had instilled in me. Excuse me, I just want to take a little drink. But um, when the poems just started to creep back in 2012, I remember how surprised I was. I had gone up to Mayo for a regular bi biannual visit, and um, the doctor had told me that I was predisposed to, to developing um, diabetes. So I was really trying to keep my weight down and the sugar and all of that. And when I did my little three days of tests and came in that Friday, she said, well, I have bad news and I have good news. And I just knew the bad news was going to be the she, that I was diabetic, no longer just pre-diabetic. And she said, oh, no, your, your, your sugar's fine, your sugar levels, and what is it, your A1C, oh, that's good. She said, it's your IgA and the light chains, and that poems is creeping back. 
and I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. It was 2012, so it had been eight years, and I said, but I thought I would feel sick, you know, first. And, you know, she explained that what I had, they also call a smoldering myeloma. So left untreated or treated too long incorrectly, it develops into a very vicious cancer. And it had been in sort of a remission, and it was beginning to creep back. It was nothing like what I had had. But they wanted to be proactive, and they had some advances in, in medicines at that time, and they put me on some oral chemo pills, uh, Revlimid, some other things. I didn't adjust very well. I pretty much asked for another bone marrow transplant. And while some people think of a bone marrow transplant is painful, physically painful, it is not. They take the bone marrow from the blood. It, is, it just wipes your slate clean, and it makes you extremely weak. So they, you know, it takes six months to almost a year to recover. And so I had it in 2015 and retired in 2016. And that had seven good years of reporting. When I look back now and think about this book tour, I knew that I would get an answer on what I wanted to do when I was home. I didn't want to be bored. And it was my, it was my younger son, Leland, who is 34 now. He almost daily, when are you going to write that book, Mom? He said, you got to write a book. you got to write a book. I'm thinking as a mother, here's my baby boy, and he thinks it's cool to write a book, and I really don't want to write a book. And one day, we were sitting there, and he says, I'm serious, Mom. I was talking to him. He went to school with um, <clears throat> Billy Tierney, whose dad happens to be Brian Tierney. And he said, I was talking to Bill and his dad the other day, and he thinks you should write a book. And he said, you, do you know how many people you would help? And I thought about it from that perspective. And I said, maybe this is part of God's plan. That maybe I could, because there are a lot of things I learned. <laughs> I remember when I was trying to fill out all those medical papers, and I wondered how my husband's patients, because I had, you know, when, his, when he started his practice, I was sort of his secretary. And I thought about Mrs. Gillette and Mr. Thompson on West Philadelphia and up in Kensington and Southwest Philly. How would they get through this? I had to ask for help. So I thought about all the things I had learned, and Leland had Brian Tierney call me and help me get a publisher, and it just happened. Those things that I was afraid of reliving became very therapeutic to me, reliving them and going through them. And when I'm out on, on, a, on a tour or a book signing, I hope that I've dispensed some knowledge that helps people, but I always learn something too. Because everybody's got their story. Everybody's got something or loves someone who has. So I ask myself after two bone marrow transplants and all of the things that have happened in this journey, what have I learned? And I think I've learned not to sweat the small stuff because I was an A-type personality. Things had to be in order. I've learned not to do that so much. I think I've learned that that when chaos comes in our lives, it's not always coming to destroy and cause upheaval. Sometimes it's coming to clear our path. I've learned to keep believing in myself. I have learned to apologize to myself. When you really think about it, an apology isn't worth much unless you're able to forgive yourself first. I've learned that each of us has a right to a happiness that transcends all the materialistic forces that surround us. Each of us has a right to a joy that we nurture and sustain from the wellspring of our being. And we have to love ourselves. We have to learn that love must be internalized. We can't be so busy that we don't know what we're about and learn to love ourselves first. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for that 
that confidence in your lives, that faith, that love of self. And thank you very much again for having me this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.